and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! RFM, we are back. Here it is, another episode of Mormonism Live. How are you, my good friend? I am great. Thank you. I think it's episode number 30 tonight. Episode number 30. We are, yeah, we are uh, 30 episodes in. Um, by the way, folks, you may notice that the super chat on YouTube looks just slightly different. Uh, we now have it set up and we'll show you a screenshot later on and show you how it works. But you guys have been asking if you can donate through YouTube and if all the proceeds go to Mormon discussion from here on out, you'll see there on the right hand side as part of the chat and just underneath it, you can make donations and those donations are 100 percent going to Mormon Discussion Incorporated, and uh, YouTube even pays the processing fee RFM, so we get all of it. Well, fantastic. Those wonderful people at YouTube. Look at that. They have been super friendly. Um, you are in charge tonight, so why don't you run us through? This is going to be kind of uh, strange in a sense. Um, I'll let you kind of give the listeners kind of a heads up on what's going on here and how the format's going to work, and we'll do our best to make this uh, – a really cool show. I'm really excited about what you're about to reveal. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. By the way, tonight is the night. It's June 30th of 2021. And remember, Taylor Drake was on last week's show talking about his book, Joseph in the Gap, and how it was that he scheduled for a disciplinary hearing tonight at 7 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. So that is going to be, if I'm calculating it correctly, in one hour and 38 minutes, now 37 minutes. Yeah, he's going to be uh, going under the gun. In the truck. under the knife. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's hanging time. So That's anyway, uh, let's, I think we should have a moment of silence in honor of uh, Taylor Drake. Okay, that's long enough. But certainly <laughs> I'm, I'm sending all my great thoughts, all my best thoughts toward him. Okay, so, so tonight... Tonight, all right, it's going to be something that I think is going to be a substantive contribution to Mormon studies. It appears to be something that has not been discovered before or no, no connection made. To the best of my knowledge and other people who know about this kind of stuff, it has not been published on. And yet we're going to present it here for what I believe is the first time publicly here on Mormonism Live. So a little background, there is a particular listener to this program who lives somewhere in the, uh, well, England. I, I hope that's not too narrow. He, he needs to preserve somewhat his identity for personal reasons. And we had everything set up. He reached out to me a couple of weeks ago with this um, idea. And I immediately recognized that it was important. He thought it was important. I thought it was important. So we've done a lot of work to get things together and pictures together. And to get him on the show, it is, by the way, 124 in the morning, tomorrow morning in England. And he was going to join us with video. But all of a sudden, earlier this evening, in England, all the internet, the broadband went down. It crashed. So we've been going back and forth and back and forth. And it looks like they're not going to be able to have it up until sometime tomorrow. So we were on the verge of rescheduling, but now here's what's going on. This individual, whose name is Stuart Rogers, yeah. has gotten up, gotten out of bed in the middle of the night, and now he's driven 15 to 20 minutes to a nearby hill to get up on top of the hill so he can have some signal. And he has called in on the regular call-in line He's waiting now on the line. He'll be talking to us. He won't be able to be seen uh, visually, but at least he and we came up with a solution whereby we can proceed with this uh, discussion tonight. So having said all of that, Stuart Rogers, can we get him on the line, Bill? Making this more complicated is the fact that uh, 
he can't hear me as I'm speaking. He can hear Bill. Yeah. So Bill may have to relay things to him, but he's going to tell his story. It's an interesting story. This isn't a recent discovery. He's discovered this 10, 15 years ago when he was watching the telly over there in England. He saw something very interesting and we pursued that. We've developed it and we'll be presenting it this evening. Is he there? Is Stuart Rogers there and ready to tell his story, Bill? Stuart, are you on the line, my friend? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So beautiful. Glad to, glad to have you on. And uh, so RFM just kind of gave us a, uh, a little bit of a backdrop of what, what is going on without giving any kind of specifics. And uh, I, th I think at this point, if are you good, RFM, if he gives us kind of an, all right, so why don't you run us through uh, your story and along the way, if you want something to go up on the screen that we've prepared, just say so. Give me, you know, give me a few seconds and I will put it up on the screen for everybody. Okay. Okie dokies. Um, yeah, just say, um, I think um, RFM explained I'm in, on a hill somewhere in England. Yes. Um, the internet isn't down over the whole of England. Uh, just where I am. Gotcha. Just um, where you are. Just where I am. Yeah, so um, I reached out to RFM a couple of weeks back. Something I've uh, been sitting on for such a long time and thought it was quite interesting. Uh, so there's me, uh, I would say, 15 years ago, where watching um, telly on a Sunday afternoon, watching the Antiques Roadshow. And I just want to point out here to, if our, to RFM, we had a discussion about this during the week. And... Um, he said that he thought the Antiques Roadshow was done first in America and then in England, but he's wrong. RFM is wrong. I can tell you that um, it started in 1979 in England and 1997 in the, in the US. Anyway, just letting you know. That's only the third you know. time, by the way. Oh, just letting you know. Just letting you know. Stuart, uh, that's only. Uh, yeah, Stuart, so that's Thursday just the third. And I want to I go to bed, so let's get the story done. Yeah. yeah. So I was watching Antiques Roadshow and. Um, and I've been having some some concerns about something said in the Book of Mormon, and on comes this brass ball, this what they described as a hand warmer, and it was oh I don't know I must have been about eight nine inches in circumference, and it was brass and it had curious workmanship, and I was like oh, this is a bit crazy, so I just thought well that's good, but please don't open it up and let me see spindles and anyway sure enough they opened up they opened up this ball sort of split it from the top in the in the middle and inside were these two stroke three spindles that held a, a sort of oil lamp and it was a hand warmer from for coaches and i was like oh that looks remarkably close to a leahona but anyway then i'm thinking it's probably coming back it's probably very old uh, you know it's got to be, it can't be, it can't be right. And then the person describing it, <clears throat> who was an expert on the show, sort of clarified that it was actually uh, made in upstate New York. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> upstate New York uh, in the early 1800s. And I'm like, okay, that's very, very interesting. So anyway, I've been sitting on that for a long, long time. I've told a few people in my over my years, but not many. And um, I'm just fascinated. No one's ever picked that up. So a couple of weeks back, I thought, well, RFM's a go-getter. He'll have a look. On, he'll get his nose under the bonnet. And so I threw it on his um, Facebook channel. And um, here we are. That's it. That's my story. That's your story, my friend. Awesome. RFM, any thoughts from you before in terms of where we go from here? No, I would like it if Stuart could tell us a story about uh, – one member of the church, one of the few members of the church that he actually presented this to. And when you ask him that question, Bill, I think you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Stuart, would you tell us the story about when I feel like I'm a sign language person, right? Like you tell me what I need to say and I'll pass on the telephone game. Stuart, would yeah, you tell yeah, us yeah. about the, the, the experience you had where you shared it with a, uh, a person from the church? Yeah. Well, with a couple of people from the church and, um, their reaction was um, they just went quiet and it was like, yeah, they just went quiet. They couldn't say anything or didn't say anything. And I was, I got this sort of impression. They might be thinking, so you're losing your faith or 
you what are you what are you saying and i'm like i'm not in my mind i'm not, I'm not saying anything i'm just saying this is remarkably close to the to the Leona. that that was that was the experience i had with a couple of couple of people mm, gotcha okay so i think that's the story and i think that because he can't really see what we're doing when we put up the images, yeah. uh, we can leave him on as long as, as he wants to stay on. I know it's, it's somewhat costly for him, yeah. but can we put up the original, these images? Now this is a coach hand warmer. And the reason it's called a hand warmer is because it's a ball that's supposed to warm your hands in those cold upstate uh, New York winter months. And the coach part is because these were frequently used in coaches, i.e. carriages, horse drawn, the, uh, the vehicles of the day. And of course, they don't have any kind of heater. So if it's cold, you want it something to keep your hands warm. This is where this idea came from. I had never heard of this before until it was brought to my attention by Stuart Rogers. And if we can get these images up so the audience can see yeah. what it is we're talking about, that'll be super. Yeah, I can do that. So Stuart, you're welcome to stay on the line as long as you need to or want to. Um, otherwise, we're going to kind of move on and... RFM will kind of pick it and I will kind of pick it up from here and we'll start showing the audience the images. Um, is there anything else on your end that you feel a need to kind of convey? Otherwise, we could even just let you go and you could. Yeah, there, there was just one thing. First of all, you saying I can go to bed. Yeah, please, by all means, have some tea and crumpets well, and I get to yourself bed, to bed. Before I go to bed, I just want to mention one thing. Yes. And that is that uh, England beat Germany yesterday after 55 years at the Wembley Stadium. I think that's quite remarkable. That is and a I big deal. All the English people listening, they should be a minute silence at the, in, in this show somewhere. Awesome. We will try to do that. We'll try to give a minute of silence somewhere <laughs> along the joking? way. Well, I'm Leave it. But anyway, just thought I'd say, okay, guys, if you've got all that, that's cool. And, and you're pulling it apart. That'd be great. Awesome. We'll, we'll just hang up with you and you can watch the rest of the show yourself. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Go have a to hand it over to you guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Tally ho. Go to Himmel. I cannot right, believe so, those Englishmen beat us in the, the football game. So it I want to make sure I'm putting up the right images, but let's let's hope this is one of them. Um, give me a moment to kind of increase the size of it. Increase uh, the size of the balls. Here is, we go. Is that it? This is it. Now, here is an image. This was actually, I think it was, it was obviously up for sale. It's been sold. This is called an antique brass Indian hand warmer. These are not only in the United States. They're also found in other areas of the world. And this is what it looks like. It is made out of brass, as the name would indicate. It is round. It's a round ball. And it has this ornate workmanship associated oh. with it. You'll that see sounds it. so familiar to something. I've I've heard that kind of phraseology before. Well, I said ornate. The Book of Mormon uses curious, but that's what mm. it means is ornate. Yeah. And we'll get into that here in a second too. But notice the clasp there on this ball. You see there's a clasp there you can undo. And what it does is it opens up. We'll get to pictures with it open up later. Um, and it, there's a hinge on the back. So it opens up in the, into the two hemispheres. Okay. So do you have other pictures there of complete balls? Yeah, I do. Let me uh, let me pull them up. It takes kind of a moment to do this, but this is a little bit closer. And so I can zoom in on this. Oh, that's the same one, I think. Okay, you want to see different ones. Yeah, so you can okay. see that there's this ornate or curious workmanship in the brass balls. Um, and there are sort of holes that are put into the brass ball. And the idea behind this, we'll talk about this more once we look into the interior of the brass ball, but it's a hand warmer. Okay, here's a really, really ornate one. Look at that, that is pretty damn fancy. It is, and it's almost like this was part of the art of making these, that uh, to make them ornate, to make them intricate, to make them actually works of art, things of beauty, in addition to being practical in warming your hands. So there's another one. Yep, and I can, uh, let's see if this works. Uh. And as Stuart was telling me the story on the phone, oh, here's another one. Yeah. And that's actually, I believe that's different from the, and there's another one. Yep. There's another one. And, and it's going to be a little hard. I want to be able to zoom in on some of these so people can see them. But that is, that is ornate. That, and that does look like some curious workmanship. 
It is. It's very curious. And no man could work after this kind of workmanship. Right, right. Let me see if I've got uh, any others. That part I'm kidding. That's a reference to the Book of Mormon. But obviously, these are man-made. Oh, you guys are going to love this one. What's this? Oh, look yeah. How, look how fancy. It's absolutely beautiful. I mean, if you, you showed any Mormon, you showed any Mormon this image and gave them three guesses, you wouldn't even need the other two, would you? I've got to tell you, I've been sending these image by, images by text to certain discreet uh, people I know because this has been a big secret up until now. And I, I just send them the text, right, of the pictures. And I say, does this look familiar? And immediately they come back to me. Liahona. Yeah. It's the Liahona. Well, of course it's the Liahona. What else would it be? Yeah, it's look a hand that. warmer. Look at this wow. thing. Yeah. So, so all we see so far are just brass balls, you know, kind of like, kind of like you and me. And that is the title, the title of the show. And actually, it was supposed to be sort of a double entendre because uh, Stuart Rogers, you know, it was very difficult for him to come on the show. We had to work it out in certain ways. We had other things planned because he doesn't want to give away his real identity because he's concerned about family and all the things that that Mormons, even if they're just talking about hand warmers for crying out loud, are concerned about. And so not only are we talking about brass balls, Stuart Rogers also had some brass balls to come on the show. Yeah, yeah, he does. I think we'll get to this later in a little video video footage that uh, we've got lined up, but yeah, it really is. It does take some courage to start speaking publicly in any way that seems disagreeable to the common correlated dominant narrative, right? Yes. Okay, so we've seen enough of these yep. um, hand warmers. Okay. And we know that they are um, in Joseph Smith's environment. They're in upstate New York. They're at the right time. They're in the right place. It is. It would be hard to think that Joseph Smith was not aware of the existence of these hand warmers. It's yeah. something that we've lost track of in the last 200 years, or at least I have, and everybody I've talked to has never heard of them before. That's because better technology came along. But do you have any pictures now of the inside of these uh, hand warmers? Yes, I do. So let me pull those ones up. Okay. And then we'll talk about what's on the inside. Okay. So here's something. All right. Now, when Stuart Rogers was telling me the story over the phone, he said that, you know, he had been talking, well, he'd been reading the Book of Mormon, having some questions about Isaiah, maybe some questions about its historical authenticity, if I can put it that way. And he's watching the antique, the BBC Antique Roadshow, and all of a sudden one of these balls is shown that's an antique. They're all antiques, obviously. And then they went to open, because his first response was what your first response was. It's probably what everybody's first response is when they're seeing it. it says, that looks like a Liahona. Yeah. And that's what he thought. This looks like a Liahona. And then they went to open it up on the show, right? And he said, there better not be any spindles in there. <laughs> and, and what are we finding? And look at the spindles. Look okay. at it. So there's spindles inside. Now there's uh, circles within circles and spindles. And the whole point of this, by the way, so that you know, the whole point of this is this little cup here. And I'm pointing to my screen. You can't see me what I'm pointing at, but you see that little cup in the middle. Okay. The purpose of that cup is to hold a small oil lamp. That's what generates the heat, is a small oil lamp. And in this case, I don't know, it might be a candle. It could be a candle or an oil lamp. I'm not exactly sure because this one doesn't actually have the oil lamp in it. Other pictures will. But the purpose of this mechanism inside is to keep the oil lamp level because if it goes on its side, you're going to have a mess and maybe a fire <laughs> inside this coach or wherever it is that you're using this to warm your hands. So this entire mechanism is there in order to keep it level. So if you're going, you know, over a bumpy New York road or wherever it is you happen to be, then this mechanism works to keep the oil lamp level. And that's very, very clever. Very clever. Yeah. No, so super, do you have yeah. there's a lot of intelligence that goes into designing something like this that as you're bumping down the road, it kind of stays fairly level. That's incredible. Yeah. And I'm sure if I had one, it wouldn't work and I would get, you know, burning oil all over me. All right, so here's the second one. Yeah, here's the second one. You open it up, and inside is that mechanism. You can see it with these circular pieces of metal, which are affixed to spindles from the four sides. 
And there is an oil lamp and the oil lamp itself is right there. And you can see the hole in the top of the oil lamp where the oil is poured in and then there's a wick and you light it and you're good to go. And you are in comfort as you ride along these roads in the coach on the cold night or a cold day for that matter. Here's another one with it open. You can see the mechanism again. There's the oil lamp inside. And by the way, while we're looking at these, we'll come back to this as well. But the first thing that this suggested to me when I looked inside and I didn't know what it was, is that it looks like an astrolabe. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. you know, astrolabe, but it's pronounced astrolabe which is an, uh, an ancient type of device that's used for measuring the heavens, among other things. Do you know that, how big these balls would have been? Like, would they have been something that you could have just could have just held it like in your hand? Because some of these did operate as hand warmers. Yeah. And it wouldn't have taken much of a flame to heat up that metal enough that your hand would have stayed comfortable as you're riding in a stagecoach. Right. So. Stewart had mentioned eight inches. I don't think it's of uniform size, but maybe around eight inches, maybe a, a little bit larger. But so you can, it's a nice large brass ball so you can hold it in your cupped hands. Yeah, I was just going to try to find a picture of, uh, of Lehigh holding it. And uh, let's see here if I can do this. Um, look at that. There right? it is. Right there. That's that's about the size of the ball, right? That's yes. Right <laughs> that looks like about an eight inch ball right there in his hands. Lehi is warming his hands there on a chilly day in the Arabian Peninsula. All right. There's there's that. Oh, here's something. Can you read the um the measurements? I don't know. That's pretty tough, but it's about eight inches. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Do you have another that is pretty one? Cool. Let me yep, let me uh, reduce the size of that one's already down. So and there's one that's open and taken apart. Oh, look at that. That you can see there's a four. It, it looks like it's about four inches to the center. So you assume another four. So then you've got an eight inch uh, distance across the entire thing. Yeah. Eight inches in diameter. Yeah. And that one we may have seen before. I don't know. Maybe we haven't, but that's what it looks like. That's how it operates. And this is the hand warmer or the types of hand warmers that Joseph Smith would have been familiar with almost yeah. certainly for these to have been made in upstate new york around the time of joseph smith and you know again all you have to do is have some degree of possibility slash plausibility and what you realize is that when the apologists operate all the time on possibility regardless of how unreasonable that is uh, for instance, the three letters of NHM in the right place at the right time, even though we're missing other letters and those three letters could represent a whole host of things. This this is just as strong, maybe stronger evidence of the opposite of what those apologists would like to propose. Right. So what we have here is a possible antecedent for the Liahona in the Book of Mormon. At least something that would have, yeah, as you're pointing out, something that would have been in Joseph's milieu that would have given him something to start from. Um, and as he's describing uh, the Liahona in the Book of Mormon, he could have easily been picturing one of these and describing this very thing. Right. So when I got these pictures and I pulled them up on the Internet, because as soon as you know the words are coach hand warmer, you can do your own Google search and come up with these images that we have just shown you. And you can see exactly what it is that they look like. Um, I had never seen it before, but I don't know everything about the Book of Mormon and Mormon studies. But I do know people who know a lot more than I do. And one of them's name is Brian Howlett. So I reached out to him, sent him the text. He's one of the people I sent it to and said, does this look familiar? And he goes back to Liahona. And I said, have you ever seen these before? He'd never seen these before. He'd never seen it in any publication, any connection being made to the Liahona. And I asked him if he would do me a favor and reach out to Dan Vogel. And he did to ask the same question, right? And Dan Vogel responds, no, I have never seen this connection made either. So based on that, I feel pretty comfortable in concluding that I don't think this has ever been commented on prior to this or this connection made in any kind of publication. So this is probably the first time it's being talked about. Somebody's publicly. asking if the manufacturer is sweaty, if these are sweaty balls. 
Oh, that's terrible. No, I think it's the Lee A. Honer <laughs> Foundation or Foundry. Yeah, the, the yeah. There you go. Oh my gosh. Super. Yeah, this is super cool. When you when you sent me the picture, I don't know what it was, maybe a week ago or so, and and began kind of planning for this episode. As you're pointing out, the moment you see it, the outside of it, and even the inside of it, that's exactly kind of the idea of what we're picturing the Liahona to be. Uh, that's what I was picturing in my head. And so, like you said, uh, in terms of sharing it with lots of other people, and all of them came back saying, that looks like the Liahona. That was my first thought as well. And the moment you place this in Joseph's milieu, the moment it becomes possible that this is the groundwork that he's working from. Right. And so the Book of Mormon, when you read it, when you study it, like I have, you start to come to the conclusion, or at least I have, that it is largely derivative. In other words, most of the stuff in the Book of Mormon you can find in other places. Obvious examples would be the Isaiah chapters. Another obvious example would be the Sermon on the Mount and other quotations from the Bible. But even the stories are frequently, not always, but frequently replications of things that are in the Bible. For instance, you have Alma, the younger, and the four sons of Mosiah who get converted by an angel appearing to them in a story that is reminiscent of Paul's conversion when he's on the road to Damascus. You have the Jaredites building eight barges and putting all the animals and everything in it and sailing across the ocean in a story that's quite reminiscent of the story of Noah mm -hmm. and the ark. And so you have many, many stories in there that look derivative. One of the few things that appears original in the Book of Mormon is the Liahona. Mm. Because where does that come from? I mean, Lehi's right. getting up in the morning. They're out in the wilderness, right? He gets up in the morning, he, he leaves his tent to go out and take a leak, and he trips over this brass ball that somebody stuck in the sand out there. And he picks it up just like in that uh, picture you showed. And he looks at it and says, what the heck is this? Well, it's a Liahona. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the similarities, okay, and the dissimilarities between the Liahona and this hand warmer. First off, the similarities. It's a round ball. That's the first one, okay? Second one, it's made of brass. By the way, I'll, I'll also throw in there that it appears to be about the right size, so we don't get any dimensions in the Book of Mormon. But we get the idea that it's something that can be held in the hand because it's used as a compass, right? Right. So, number three, it's of curious workmanship. That's how it's described in the Book of Mormon. And I think most people know that curious back then in Joseph Smith's day did not mean necessarily, hmm, that's strange. It meant intricate. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Webster's 1828 dictionary, which is the one that Joseph Smith probably would have used words that were consonant with the way that they are defined there. Yeah, which by the way, that 1828 dictionary can be found really easily online. Just do a Google search, 1828 Webster's dictionary, and you have it and you can see how every word in uh, early Mormonism is used appropriately within the English language. Right. And so that's what I did. That's how I came up with these. But they have uh, some definitions which obviously don't fit when you're talking about the workmanship of a brass ball. But when you get down to uh, number five definition, it can say nice, exact, subtle, made with care. Six is artful. Seven is the, the real one that I want to focus on. Seven is wrought with care and art, elegant, neat, finished. Mm. as a curious girdle or curious work. And there it references Exodus 28, 8, and 30 from the Bible where curious is used in the, the King James Version of the Bible in a similar way, right? Okay, so it is a round ball. It's made of brass. It's the right size. It's of curious workmanship. It also has spindles in it, all right? Now, we're going to come back to the spindles here in a second because we need to talk about that a little bit more but there are spindles inside of it. And the spindles are the small, narrow pieces of metal that other bigger pieces can revolve on, all right? So that's what spindles are. Um, also, it was found in Joseph Smith's neighborhood, in his Melu, right? So all of these things are very important connections between this hand warmer and the Book of Mormon, as well as Joseph Smith, 
who is the one who translated it or authored it. Now, there's a big difference, though, that we need to talk about. And the big difference is, I think you know what it is, Bill. I, I, I don't, other than... The hand warmer is not a compass. Right. They don't do the same <laughs> thing. One is moving in multiple directions, right? By having two spindles, you allow something to essentially move in multiple directions. Um, what is described in the Book of Mormon seems to also have two spindles, right? And one of them points the way, which is a little different than what this purpose of this ball is that we're looking at. Right. This is not used in navigation. This isn't a directional device. It's to keep your hands warm. And by the way, um, Brian Haugley, when I was talking to him about this, he made this interesting observation. I feel it's it's clever and I want to attribute it to the person who came up with it. Uh, the Book of Mormon talks about there being two spindles uh, inside the ball. OK, this can be another thing later, but inside the ball. And one of them points the way whether we should go in the wilderness. Right. Mm -hmm. What Brian said was. So how did they know this one spindle is the one that points on the right way to go into the in the wilderness until they actually get there? Right. Like picture Lehi coming out of his tent. He picks the ball up. He opens it. The, the one spindle is pointing in a specific direction. But how the hell is he supposed to know that that spindle is telling him to go to Nahum and then Bountiful, build a boat and head across the water? He, he doesn't have a clue what that thing outside his door is meant to do. No, unless there's writing on it and it says, you know, follow this spindle. And the other one says, don't follow this spindle or, that or something like, like that. A, that sounds a lot like a seer stone in a hat. It will sound more like that here in a second. By the way, I do want to emphasize this point, which I didn't emphasize enough before, is that one of the problems of there are several wrinkles in the Book of Mormon text where it's describing the Liahona. Hmm. And what I mean by that is it describes it in ways that are not exactly clear as to what it means. And one of those big things is that it's very clear in the Book of Mormon that the spindles, which it uses synonymously, by the way, with pointers, we'll get back to that, are inside the ball. Okay, it's not like a compass that we think of as a compass where you look down and the thing is right there in glass, the thing, the pointer is right there in glass and you look at it, or it's on top of something. No, it says it's inside the ball. And what the Book of Mormon doesn't say is, well, if this these pointers in, are inside the ball, how do you see it? How do you see them? And people have been you know, trying to come up with ways and answers to that. But this particular hand warmer answers that question because there's a clasp in the middle and it opens up two hemispheres and you look in and there are the spindles. So this hand warmer, I think significantly, resolves a question that's raised by the Book of Mormon text, which is not answered by the Book of Mormon text, but is answered by the way that these hand warmers are made. Did that part make sense, Bill? Yeah, that does. And I'm just getting ready if I can find it here. I saved a picture and now I'm not locating it. Go ahead, go ahead continue. I'll find this picture and uh, show folks a couple of the images of the Liahona depicted in the Book of Mormon. And I think in very cool ways matching up with what uh, with, with uh, essentially what you're describing or what we're seeing on these images. Yeah. Do you have those? Um, I can just keep talking while you're doing that. Yeah, here's, here's one, right. Uh, give me two seconds. I want to see these. Yeah. So there's one right there. Do you see that? What the heck is that? So that's, that's a not... depiction of Lehigh with the Liahona. Is that from a movie? movie? Got a hinge. Um, is that from a movie? I don't know, but but everybody who tries to depict the Liahona in the artwork, now obviously this was like a movie or some kind of real image, but um, I shouldn't say real image, but real photograph, everybody tries to depict it the same way that this, this hand warmer works, which is there's a hinge on one side and the Liahona opens. And then once you open the Liahona, there's your two spindles inside. And, and, you know, we might say like, oh, look at those. Those are those kinds of spindles. And the hand warmer has different kinds of spindles. But again, nobody's describing what these spindles are exactly other than there's two of them. And both objects have those. And what those look like really depends on an artist interpretation or a depiction in a picture like this. Right. And you see how they have this looking very much like the structure of the hand warmer, although inside it's obviously different. And there are two pointers and they're both designed differently. And 
it's pretty obvious from looking at those that one of those pointers would be the one that you would follow to point the way in the wilderness, right? Yeah. Okay. What's the, what's the other one do? Well, it doesn't say. Kind of seems useless to have two spindles, doesn't it? You really only need one. And that's another one of the wrinkles in the text because it says there's two pointers in the uh, this ball, this compass, and one of them pointed the way whether we should go in the wilderness. And then it doesn't yeah. say anything about what the other one does. Yeah, the other one, uh, yeah, I don't know. So I don't know. Maybe it's holding up an oil lamp. It doesn't say. It could be doing anything. But like yeah. I say, that's a gap in the text. So what is meant there? I don't know. So mm. let's go here. Um, okay. So the main difference is that the hand warmer is not a compass. That's the main thing, all right? And that's what I would expect an apologist to focus on. That's what I would be doing if I were an apologist. It's different in this way. We'll ignore the similarities and we'll just focus right. on the difference. There's a lot of but, it, but it's an important difference. On the other hand, the Liahona wasn't a compass either. Okay? Because it's described as being a compass, and yet compasses, magnetic compasses, so what we think of as compasses, were not even invented or used until, oh, the 11th century right. in China. And the first usage of a compass recorded in Western Europe was in the Islamic world around 1190 CE. So that's about 1700 years too late for its use in the Book of Mormon. So the Liahona itself was not a compass. I know it's called a compass, but it was not a compass. It was not a compass that used magnetic fields in order to point in a certain direction. So the, the apologist response to that has long been, well, we know it wasn't a compass. A magnetic compass because they weren't invented yet i'm sure the first thing they would say is well god created it apparently god, so god can do anything so once you make god capable of doing anything then any evidence you don't have is fine because god can just do it in the moment anyway right but what they would also say is it obviously wasn't a magnetic compass because it worked according to the faith of the people and if they had faith it would work and point the right way if it did if they didn't have faith it wouldn't point the right way and then they'd wander in the wilderness so that explanation is supported by the text, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't intended to have been portrayed as a magnetic compass, okay? Because even if it's a magnetic compass, people having faith, it works, but if they don't have faith, then God goofs with the, the spindle or something, and it doesn't work. So either way, we've got a hand warmer that is not a compass, but in the Book of Mormon, we also have a Liahona that isn't a true compass either. But nevertheless, the Liahona is described as having pointers, one of which points the direction that they should go, at least when they have faith in it. Okay. We don't know what the other pointer does. And this is a second thing is that these pointers are also called spindles in the text. They, the word spindle is equated with pointer as if they're the same thing. And that's how it's used in the book of Mormon. But technically speaking, they're not the same because a pointer points something. A spindle is the narrow thin piece of metal on which the pointer sits. And it is that spindle that allows the pointer to move and rotate. Did that part make sense? Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And again, essentially allowing whatever is in the device for it to go in two different directions simultaneously. Or at least to, yeah, go in a circle like a compass would, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It has to be on a spindle. And that's why it's important to note that uh, the spindles that are inside of the hand warmer are true spindles. And there's four of them. And that's what the mechanism moves on. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to move and keep the oil lamp from spilling. So those are real spindles that are inside. There are not pointers inside, but there are spindles. Now, there are connections, though, I think, between the hand warmer and directions. And now I'm putting on my apologist hat, just so you know, but looking at it from the other side. First off, of course, it's used in travel because it's used while you're inside a coach, right? It doesn't direct you which way you're going to go, but it is typically used while you're traveling. That's the hand warmer. The second thing comes back to the fact that when you look inside of it, it immediately struck me and it immediately struck Brian Halgood as looking like an astrolabe, which was used, among other things, for navigation. Okay. Yeah. 
So if I am Joseph Smith, I know it's a hand warmer. I open it up. It strikes me as an astrolabe. It's used for navigation. And then the prophetic imagination, to borrow Terrell Gibbons' term, begins to spark. Somebody here suggested that Don Bradley, who I, I deeply respect, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, author of The Lost 116 Pages, he believed that the other spindle was to locate game for hunting. But I, but again, once you allow room that any assumption can be made, I could also believe it helped us locate aliens, and that would also be just as possible, maybe, right? Right. Maybe less rational. So there were astro, yes, and I'll, I'll go ahead and put that up there and say I have utmost respect for Don Bradley too, but once again, we're making speculations off the text. Yeah. And one of the reasons is because when you get to the text, there are two chapters in the Book of Mormon that talk about the Leahona. One is in First Nephi, I think it's 16, and that's where it talks about him finding it. And then right after they find it, then they have the broken bow incident, and ultimately Nephi makes a bow and arrow, you know, and... They look on the ball and it directs them to the hill where he or the mountain where you can go to find game. And yeah. I don't know that it has to be a second arrow, but it could be. Who it's knows? It's a guess with no evidence, really. I mean, kind of, yeah. Barely. But this is the attraction, right? This is the attraction of the fact when you have two pointers and you describe what one does and you don't say anything about the second pointer. Well, it's a hole that's begging to be filled, right? It's a question that's begging to be answered. What is the purpose of it? And so we try and find answers to it. Um, but to do that, we have to go beyond the text because the text doesn't tell us. Now, I had sent you three pictures of astrolabes. Yeah, let me pull those up. Now, these astrolabes, they, they were very ornate. They were used by astronomers anciently to figure out where stars are in the sky. But then a modified version of them, still called an astrolabe, and later on a sextant was made by sailors in order to navigate across the ocean so we've got three pictures of those so i'm gonna have to pause for just a moment only because um it, the the trouble is that those images you sent me like i can see the images on my screen but when i go to open them uh they don't it don't it doesn't work quite the way we'd want it to it it, it essentially won't open so i'm going to pull up uh google images and try to pull up a couple of of these so that we can see them um Okay. All right. So if you see any of those there, you'd like to see a bigger picture of, I can open that up. Yeah. Let's go to, I can't even, um, uh, let's go to the, let's see, second row, as uh, second row down, second from the left. Let's see if this opens up to a big picture. Look at that. Okay. So that's a really fancy astrolabe. And you can see what I mean what, by when I looked inside of one of these hand warmers, it immediately suggested to me the astrolabe and the way it's put together with all these, these, uh, these balls within balls that turn on spindles in order to measure the sky, measure stars in the sky. And it has a whole bunch of different um, purposes, and I don't pretend to know all of them. Uh, if you can go to another one, because this is modified now into the sailor's astrolabe. And if you can go to, oh, let's see, how about same row, one, two, three, four, five, six, over. Okay, so there's a sailor's astrolabe. And this is used when you're out on the ocean and you don't know where you are. Um, you can locate stars that you recognize because you're a sailor, you know the stars, and then you use this to measure the degrees of altitude above the horizon, I believe, of a particular star, and then stars, multiple, so you can triangulate your location and you can navigate your way across an otherwise featureless ocean. And I expect that that would be similarly useful if you're going across a featureless desert. And they can chart planetary movements too. Yes, anything that's a light in the sky, absolutely. So it's interesting here when I look at this astrolabe that you have on the screen, that there's two spindles. There's two pointers. And one of them simply points in the opposite direction of the other. At least apparently it does. It's on the other side of it, right? So, but there's two spindles here. And one of them points uh, the way to the star that's going to help guide you. All right, can we see that big screen again? Let me see if there's one other thing oh, on yeah, there absolutely. that I'd sent you Go before. Back. And uh, let me see here. Yeah, everybody can get an idea for these. There's pointers. Um, 
And, and I should say, you're right. When you open up the hand warmer and then you open up the Astrolabe, it it becomes obvious that they are not the same thing, but that they work on the same principles. They seem to, yeah, because the Astrolabe, which is suggested by the hand warmer, has these pointers, which are used for help with navigation. And so you can see all these different uh, images, and I don't know if we need to uh, do any close-ups on any more. I think people get the general idea. Yeah. And you can look at this more on your own. But what I'm trying to get at here is that even though the hand warmer has nothing to do with navigation, the interior of it immediately suggests an astrolabe, which was used in navigation. So that's the point I wanted to make there. I actually have a few other points that I wanted to make because I was going back through the Book of Mormon and really trying to read closely the two different uh, chapters that talk about the Liahona. Oh, I'm going to say this too, okay? Because if I'm an apologist, I'm going to go, oh, come on, you're stretching things. It's a hand warmer. It's not an astrolabe. It's not used in navigation. That would be the response of an apologist, right? I know, because I was one for a long time. So this may seem a stretch, the connection between the astrolabe, the navigation, and the Liahona, which points the way in the wilderness. It may seem a stretch, but I will guarantee you this much, Bill Real. Let's put the shoe on the other foot. And let's say this hand warmer was not known in Joseph Smith's day. In fact, it wasn't even invented in Joseph May. Jo Joseph Smith's day on the other foot. Okay. All right. Say that again. So I was trying to find the YouTube screen so I could show folks something here in a moment, but please go ahead. I, okay. I'm just saying that if the hand warmer were not around in Joseph Smith's day, but it was discovered in an ancient dig in Israel. Oh, oh my God. It would. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. it was dated to 600 BC. And it, and it did show direction. No, it's still just a hand warmer, okay? Gotcha. It's still exactly the same way it is now, but it doesn't exist now. The hypothetical is it doesn't exist now, but it did exist back then. BC. I can guarantee you that the apologists would be making the exact same arguments I'm making about the astrolabe in order to justify the hand warmer being used as a directional device, mm. or at least suggesting a directional device. So in this case, I think what's good for the goose should be good for the gander. I love it. Okay. Uh, gonna, do you mind if I show the, the folks here at home something? Uh, sure, as long as it's clean. Oh, it's clean. So okay. I just want to show folks, this because I, I told you I wanted to kind of butt in somewhere in the middle uh, before we get to the phone calls and show folks. So this is uh, up on the screen is me pausing uh, our live show. And there's those two beautiful men. But if you look off to the right here in the super chat, at the very top of the super chat, there is a support the podcast. That is uh, a place you can donate. It is a donation uh, clickable link. Y YouTube will allow you to then donate to Mormon Discussion Incorporated uh, without any money being taken out. YouTube pays the processing fee for us. Thank you. Thank you, YouTube. And uh, you can also go down below and you can put that you want to donate as well. Just click that donate button. It brings up, you can pick whatever amount you want. Uh, you can have your name show up in the live chat that you gave the money. We'll put it up on the screen so everybody can see that you did that. And this took me a little while to do. I know for weeks and weeks, folks have been in the comments saying, hey, does YouTube still take a large portion of the, of the donation or the money that we're giving? And they did. And now that's fixed. Now it looks like 100% goes to us. Well, that's Great. all. Can you can you work until 150% goes to us? That would is be YouTube, really nice, wouldn't it? Is YouTube that nice? I, I don't think so. No, no. No. And, and then maybe just one other note, which is that we're putting a bunch of our old content uh, on YouTube, and there are folks who are seeing that happen. We're actually getting a lot of views on those videos, uh, and, and YouTube is telling us that that's due to uh, searches on YouTube and Google searches as well, or other search engine searches. And so I'm really excited about the number of people who never had access to our material before who now do. And, and I'm and quite excited to see how this unfolds over the next few weeks. Yeah, I'm excited about it too. And all the credit goes to you for figuring out how to do this, Bill, and then shaking my cage enough to get me to try and you know put these in a format that you could use then to put up on YouTube. So yeah, you're doing all the work. Yeah. So if you go to the Mormon discussion, uh, YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of Radio Free Mormons content, a lot of Mormon discussions content. The next thing I'm going to put up is 
the conversations on the gospel topic essays that Anthony Miller and Alan Mount and I had. And I've reached out to Alan and Katie and asked them to start preparing uh, marriage on a tightrope episode so we can put those on the YouTube channel as well. And so, folks, if you're in a pinch and you can't find it on the website or something, you'll have them on YouTube, too. Fantastic. Love it. All, All right, right. Back to you. There's our intermission. I want to make about three comments here in hopefully 10 minutes, 15 minutes tops. But I think they're important as they relate to other wrinkles and interesting things in the text of the Book of Mormon about the Liahona. So if you go to 1 Nephi chapter 16, that's where the, the um, Liahona makes its first appearance, miraculously, right? And I'm going to go through this really quick. If you want to open up your Book of Mormon and follow along, please do. This is verse 10. And it came to pass that as my father arose in the morning and went forth to the tent door to go outside and take a leak, to his great astonishment, it's right there. This is in the 1830 version, by the way. To his great astonishment, he beheld upon the ground a round ball of curious workmanship. And it was a fine brass. And within yeah. the ball, there's the part that talks about it's inside the ball. And within the ball were two spindles and the one pointed the way whether we should go into the wilderness. So we've been referring to this a little bit as we've talked about this, uh, this hand warmer. So we've talked about the question, what did the other spindle do? The book doesn't say. And notice also that the text equates pointers with spindles. We talked about that as well. And I also went to Webster's Dictionary again, the 1828 Dictionary, which I think may have been his first. Um, and the second definition for a spindle is a slender pointed rod or pin on which anything turns or which anything turn as in the spindle of a vein, like a weather vane, right? When you've got a weather vane up on top of a barn or whatever, the spindle is the part that goes up inside of it that it can turn around. Okay, that's what a spindle is. It's also called a pivot. Makes sense. So that's the Webster's Dictionary again. So technically a spindle would be something on which the pointers turned or pivoted in the ball. At least the way spindle was understood in Joseph Smith's day and continues to be understood today. However, for some reason, and it's not clear, the Book of Mormon seems to use pointer and spindle interchangeably. And then in verse 16, we're still in First uh, Nephi 16. And can we can I just continue. interrupt you for just a second? Yeah, yeah. Which is, I just want to note, ball of curious workmanship. That seems like if we were looking at the these hand warmers, we would go like that's that's pretty damn descriptive, and that def kind of looks like what I'm seeing in those in those images. Fine brass. Joseph Smith intentionally, if we believe Joseph Smith made up the book, he intentionally picks brass to be the material that those balls are made out of, and that seems to be the material that most of these hand warmers are made out of as well. Correct? Yes. Yeah, and then inside are two spindles, so we're three for three so far. Right. Right, but it doesn't show how to go in the wilderness. I mean, it doesn't, it's not a compass, but we've already covered that. Right. I just want to make sure that we're being fair and talking about the dissimilarities as well as the similarities. Absolutely. So verse 16, and we did follow the directions of the ball. That word directions is going to be important here when we get to Alma 37 in a minute. And we did follow the directions of the ball, which led us in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. Now, it is not clear when it's talking about the directions of the ball, whether it's talking about the way the pointer is pointing, the one that points the way whether we should go, we would think that that's what it would be talking about, except that later on, it's gonna talk about this strange writing, apparently a mystical, supernatural kind of writing that appears on the ball. And there's a new writing from time to time. So it's not etched into the brass. Instead, these are words that appear on the ball. And they give directions as well as to what these Nephites or Lehites and his family should do. So it's not clear whether the directions of the ball is the pointer or whether it's the messages that appear with directions on the ball or both. But it does say we did follow the directions of the ball, which led us in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. And now going on to 26. Okay, here's where we get to the writing. This is so cool. This is not your average compass. It's like a compass and a hand warmer and a magic eight ball all rolled into one. It's like a Swiss army knife. Yeah. So verse 26, and it came to pass that the voice of the Lord said unto him, that be unto Lehi, right? Mm -hmm. Look upon the ball and behold the things which are written. And it came to pass mm -hmm. that when my father beheld the things which were written upon the ball, he did fear and tremble exceedingly. And also my brethren and the sons of Ishmael and our wives. 
So this seems to be somewhat of a detailed writing. I don't know what it is. We don't get told, but it sure scares the bejesus out of them. So writing appears upon the ball. Notice that it says the writing appears upon the ball. Let me uh, go ahead and make this connection here that this sounds an awful lot like the way that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon mm. because he has a seer stone. And according to the witness statements, what would happen is he'd take the stone, put it in the hat, put his face over the hat, and in the darkness, the supernatural light would shine, right? And in that light, there were, there were words that would appear apparently upon the stone or above the stone that Joseph Smith would then be able to read off to the scribe. Yeah, let's go one step further, which is as Joseph Smith is reading those words that you just read that are up on the screen, he would have had his face in a hat with a stone at the bottom and claiming to see words in the same exact kind of way. Would you say that again? While Joseph Smith was dictating the very words of verse 26, his face was buried in a hat, excluding all light with a rock at the bottom, and words were appearing to him. The very words that are in verse 26 about words appearing to Lehi. Brilliant. Brilliant. Oliver Henry may not have picked up on the subtle, uh, the subtle imposition there. That is fascinating. Great point. Worth repetition. It took twice for me to get it. No big deal. Uh, it's because I'm so focused on what I'm saying as well. So the, the writing appears upon the ball. It makes them tremble. This is like a seer stone where writing appears upon the seer stone in order for the Book of Mormon to be translated. Okay, so there's similarities here. We're going to continue to see these similarities, this overlapping of descriptions and uh, properties between the Liahona and a seer stone. And this will become important here in a couple of minutes. I think I'm already almost over my 10 minutes. I'll try and speed it up. But this is fascinating stuff to me. So if we go now to 28, and it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the pointers which were in the ball. Now they're pointers, okay? This is where he tries to use, uh, sort of uses pointers as synonymous with spindles, even though I don't think they necessarily are. But who knows? Who knows how they're using it? Beheld the pointers which were in the ball, that they did work according to the faith and diligence and heed which we did give unto them, Right. 29, and there was also written upon them a new writing. So is the writing that appears, the supernatural writing that changes from time to, time to time on the ball or on the pointers or on both? Because earlier it talks about it being on the ball. Now it's talking about it being upon the pointers. Verse 29, and there was also written upon them a new writing, which was plain to be read, which did give us understanding concerning the ways of the Lord. So this is kind of complicated. I mean, this isn't just uh, a text, a brief text, you know, with an emoji. This is some complicated writing that is appearing that's being read off the spindles. So I can see why you might want it on the ball because you've got a bigger surface for it to be read off of. How, how good are you at reading a new writing? Well, I think I'm pretty good at it. Because <laughs> every day I wake up in a new world. Yeah. But a new writing, I think what it means is not a new language, but something new is written. Hmm. You see, there was also written upon them a new writing, which is plain to be read, which to give us understanding concerning the ways of the Lord. And it was written and changed from time to time, according to the faith and diligence, which we gave unto it. So there's the idea about it gets changed from time to time. So there's a writing, but it's not etched in the ball, but it appears upon the ball or upon the pointers, and it gets changed from time to time to give new messages to Lehi and company. And then in verse 30, this will also be interesting. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, did go forth up into the top of the mountain according to the directions, okay, which were given upon the ball. Now when it's talking about directions, it appears to be referring to the messages and not the pointers. Why didn't the spindle just tell him where to go? Why did he now need new writing on the ball or the spindles to tell him where to go? This seems almost overly complicated, doesn't it? It does somewhat. So it functions somewhat as a compass with a pointer, but it also functions as a Urim and Thummim or as a seer stone. It's a yeah. communication method from God to Lehi. And that's how God can give messages to Lehi, in addition to visions and dreams and appearing before him in a pillar of fire. 
Okay. Um, my my question too, verse 31, this is yeah. how they would obtain food, beast and uh, other things to eat. Did did the beast ever slip further into the earth? Did the what? Did the beasts? Did the beast ever slip further into the earth like the Spanish treasures? Okay, I got it. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think they did. There's no record of that happening, at no. least in the Book of Mormon. Unlike the swords and, and the treasures of the Nephites later on, right, that did slip. They were slippery treasures. Very in the morning slippery. when we did wake, we could not find them and all that stuff. Yeah. Very good, though. Very, very good. Um, and so is, and I ask the question here, is this why the interpreters are sometimes called directors? Because they not only interpret, they also give directions. All right. And I'm going to get into this now in Alma 37 really quickly, because this is where the name is given of the Liahona. And Alma's talking to his wayward son. I'm pretty sure it's his wayward son. Um, is it his wayward son? I don't care who it is. It's his son. I'm not seeing it right here. No, it's Helaman. He's a good son. Okay. And he's the one who's going to get, apparently, the Liahona. Is going to be given to him and the plates are going to be given to him and he's going to continue to be the record keeper. But if you go down there, the first thing it's going to talk about is the stone. This is the gazelum or what gazelum passage in verse 23. Verse 23, there we are. And it's going to talk about the stone and we're going to come back to that in a second. But before we talk about that, I want to point out that later on, starting in verse 38, okay, he talks about the Liahona. And this is where he says, and now my son, I have somewhat to say concerning the thing which our fathers call a ball or director, or our fathers called it Liahona, which is being interpreted a compass. And the Lord prepared it. And behold, there cannot any man work after the manner of so curious a workmanship. That's why I was saying no man could uh, make a ball like this. And behold, it was prepared to show unto our fathers the course which they should travel in the wilderness. And here it is again in verse 40, where it says that uh, if they had faith to believe that God could cause that those spindles, once again, using this interchangeable language between spindles and pointers, that those spindles should point the way they should go. Behold, it was done. And let me see here. Then it talks about how uh, sometimes they were slothful and they didn't have enough faith. And they had to not travel a direct course in the wilderness, but if they'd had faith and they could have traveled a straight line. And then he likens it unto our faith in the word of Christ, which we, if we give heed to it and have faith in it, then it will point us a direct line to the promised land. Um, okay. But here's the director's part. Okay. So do you notice this, the way verse 40, it mentions that both spindles now point the way instead of just one spindle? Yes, thank you. I had that underlined. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I appreciate it. Yeah, now it is those spindles, plural, should point the way they should go. So it goes from one pointing the way whether we should go in the wilderness and not talking about what the second spindle does to Alma talking about it. Now both spindles point the way that they should go. So there appears to be a... Um, the contradiction there between the two texts. Of course, I suppose it's possible that uh, when Nephi's talking about it, the one spindle points the way we should go in the wilderness and the other one does too, but I just didn't mention it. And if there are translation errors, they are errors of men anyway. Yes, very good, yes. Wherefore, you know, despise not the, the work of God. So let's go back now to the part about the stone and then I'll shut up and we'll take some phone calls, okay? Okay. And the Lord said, I will prepare unto my servant Gazalem a stone, singular, which shall shine forth in darkness unto light, that I may discover unto my people who serve me all their wickedness and their abominations. Verse 24. And now, my son, these interpreters, plural, were prepared that the word of God might be fulfilled, which he spake, saying, I will bring forth out of darkness unto light all their secret works, blah, blah, blah. And... Uh, those kinds of things, out of darkness unto light. And here we have what is uh, apparently a description in the Book of Mormon of a seer stone that is used to be put in a dark place and to bring things out of darkness unto light. So in other words, this, see, this stone that's referred to here uh, appears to operate in a similar method to the way Joseph Smith's seer stone did. It brings these things forth 
out of darkness unto light. But once again, it's very specific. It's a stone, but then it's called, and now my son, these interpreters, plural. And this is um, a wrinkle in the text. Why is it clear it's one stone, but then it refers to it, it with a plural term, interpreters. Well, as I was studying this and looking at this as closely as I could in preparation for tonight's show, it occurred to me that possibly the reason for this is because when it's talking about the interpreters, it's not just talking about the stone. It's also talking about the Liahona, which is going to be mentioned later on in the same chapter. So it's the stone and the Liahona that are the interpreters. It's just a possibility. We have to do something with this because it's very obvious a disconnect between a singular and a plural. Well, why is the singular being referred to as a plural? I'm suggesting maybe it's because it's referring to two things, the stone and the Liahona, and not just the stone itself. Okay, hang on just a second here. I've got a bit of a cold too, RFM. I've had to pause several times and not annoy the audience with a cough. Well, I'm just doing too much talking, I know. But remember, if you go back down there to where it talks about the Liahona later on in the same chapter, it talks about that it gives directions, right? And we saw that in First Nephi as well. It gives directions. It directs them to the way that they should go in the wilderness. Okay. Because we would look at this and say, well, the thing that doesn't make sense about this is that we can understand why the seer stone is an interpreter, right? But how is the Liahona an interpreter? That doesn't seem to make very much sense. Mm. And so that's why I want to pull out my 1830 copy of the Book of Mormon. Because if you will go back to that part that's talking about the seer stone in verse 24. Do you have that there? Right there. And now my son, these interpreters were prepared that the word of God might be fulfilled, which he spake saying. Right. That's not the way it read in the 1830 version of the book of Mormon. It did not have the word interpreters there. I bet Elder Holland knew this because that's what his master's thesis was on oh. in order to get his uh, master's degree in arts. Well, I bet he did. Guess what the word was? The word was, and now my son, these directors. I would have laughed if you just had hand warmers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I laugh for you. It doesn't say hand warmers, but it's not interpreters. It was directors. And now, my son, these directors were prepared that the word of God might be fulfilled. And when you understand directors was the original word. By the way, that's the way it read up until 1920. Hmm. In 1920, they finally were sick and tired of reading about directors. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to them. How are these directors? Well, they're interpreters, so they put interpreters. And they put it both places where it occurs. By the way, let's hold this up here to the camera. This is actually not an original 1830 copy of the Book of Mormon, but on page 328, it's a facsimile. You'll Show find that it says, uh, yeah. Will you put that up on the screen one more time? I put you a little bigger, so on well, the other side. Yeah, so folks can pause that and they could probably read that. It looks like it comes in pretty good. By the way, notice that Joseph Smith had plenty of editions. There was the 1830. There's the 1837 out of Kirtland. There is, uh, I think there's an 1839 maybe. I know there was an 1841 in Liverpool, England. There's an 1842, I think, uh, set of the Book of Mormon produced, or 1843 maybe in Nauvoo. But there were four or five different Book of Mormon product, you know, printings productions in uh, in Joseph Smith's lifetime and when he was dead and gone the word directors was still in there oh yes and by the way it occurs twice if you go to go to verse 21 21 yes we are there where it has this long thing about and now I was speaking to you concerning those 24 plates that you keep them mysteries and works of darkness secret works of people who've been destroyed i.e the Jaredites 
may be made manifest unto this people. Yea, all their murders and robbings and their plunderings and all their wickedness and abominations may be made manifest unto this people. Yea, and that ye preserve these directors. Hmm. Is what it said originally there as well. So that was changed to interpreters. So now today it reads, yea, and that ye preserve these interpreters. Originally it was directors. And then again in verse 23, verse 24, where it says, and now my son, these interpreters, that was originally, and now my son, these directors were prepared that the word of God might be fulfilled, which he spake, saying, okay. So my, my suggestion here is that whereas interpreters doesn't seem to work equally well for the stone and the Liahona, directors does seem to work equally as well for both because directions, remember directions are not just directions where you go in the wilderness. They're also directions as to what you should do. So the stone gives direction and it was through the seer stone that Joseph Smith received a number of commandments, right? It wasn't just used for interpreting. It was also used for revelation. Yeah, so he I, uses a stone for to receive messages and directions from God. The Nephites used the Liahona to receive directions from God in the writing that appears on it from time to time. And in addition, it gives them the direction that they should go in the wilderness. So directors appears to apply equal, equally well to the stone and the Liahona. And therefore, I'm giving it as a suggestion right now that when this is used here in the book of Alma 37, it's talking about the directors. The reason the plural is used for a singular stone is because it's not talking just about the stone, but it's talking about the stone and the Liahona as well. Yeah. Okay. The 1828 Webster's Dictionary of Director, number four, that which directs or controls by influence. Uh, number five, it makes mention of a surgical tool that would guide uh, a knife or an incision tool to stay on a straight path or to be on the path that the surgeon wanted it to be on. So maybe kind of a connection there too. Yes. And one final thing. Okay. This is it really. Now that we've seen this overlap of function and form between the seer stone in the book of Mormon and the one that Joseph Smith used. And when I say the seer stone in the book of Mormon, I mean, Gazalem as described in Alma 37 and the Liahona, as it's described in the Book of Mormon, then let's look at the Gazelum, which shines forth out of darkness into light, right? It brings forth darkness unto light. And it's very similar. In fact, it's almost a self-description of how Joseph Smith is using the seer stone to dictate and translate the Book of Mormon with the words appearing on it. And then the words changing after they're written down by the scribe and checked to make sure they're right. Then a new writing appears and he reads that off. And so on, the translation goes as the witnesses have it. So there's this element of light that comes out of the, the stone. And it's in the light that the words shine, according to one witness's statement. So having said that, having connected or shown the overlap in the language between these two, it may be significant that if it's a cold, dark winter night and you're in a coach and you're lucky enough to have a hand warmer with a little oil lamp inside that's lit. What is that going to look like? Hmm. What you're going to have is a round brass ball of curious workmanship with all these little filigree and tiny little holes throughout. It's going to have an interior source of light, which will shine out and you'll be able to see it. So in that way, the, the hand warmer functions very much like the seer stone that Joseph Smith used, as well as the seer stone Gazalem that's described in the Book of Mormon. So that's all I have to say about the subject tonight. The main thing is this great discovery made by Stuart Rogers over there in England about the hand warmer and its potential as an a prototype or at, at least an antecedent for Joseph Smith's use of and description of the Liahona in the pages of the Book of Mormon. Mm, I love it. I love it. I'm just putting some of these photos back up again. You can just see the, the, the gaps and holes that would have allowed light to come through. You can see being made of brass, it would have retained heat to a degree that it would have been much more comfortable to be out in the cold holding one of these things. 
Um, and imagine yeah. if it's dark and you've got this and you got the lamp going and what that looks like. It's got to be absolutely enchanting. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a pretty thing to, to, to have near you and kind of look at, kind of almost uh, take your mind off the long, bumpy road down a dirt trail, huh? Yes. Oh, and I have to say this about Stuart is that he, he has certain questions and issues relating to Mormon history and Mormonism today. And he feels that he's in a place where he can't really talk about it openly yeah. because of the negative ramifications it will have on friends and family. And when I was talking with him on the phone, he asked me if I'd ever seen the movie Serpico. And I said, yeah, a long time ago. And there is a scene in Serpico. By the way, Serpico is a great movie. I think it's from 73 or so. It's in the early 70s. It's Al Pacino. And he plays a, uh, a drug cop. I'm pretty sure it's New York City. He's an undercover drug cop. And the problem is, is that the police department, the, the vice squad, the narco unit, whatever they called it back then, is just rife with corruption. And it's based on a true story. This guy named Serpico. And he tries to fight against it. And he suffers a great deal for trying to do the right thing and to fight against the corruption. And so I believe it's at the end of the movie. I haven't seen it in a long time, but there's a speech that Al Pacino as Serpico makes. It's just like a minute long. And Stuart Rogers felt uh, such a connection to the speech because he felt like this is how he feels but not toward the New York City Police Department, toward the LDS Church. So what he did was he went and got this snippet, this scene of Al Pacino and giving the speech. And he just changed the words a little bit to make it appropriate to the LDS Church. And it represents how Stuart Rogers feels. He shipped it over to somebody that we all know. I'll let you guys guess who's doing the voiceover if you want to. It's actually not Al Pacino's voice. It had to be re-recorded with this new script, but it actually follows almost verbatim what it is that Al Pacino says in the movie, but you'll guess where the few changes are. And maybe you can guess who it is who's doing the voiceover. Do you have that ready? I do. Here we go. And there you have it. Uh, I watched that. I'm impressed with Al Pacino's acting skills. And uh, I can see why it resonates so much with Stuart Rogers. It certainly resonates to some degree with me and probably to many members of our audience. And I want to thank uh, Stuart. I have to keep coming back to this name and looking down to make sure I get it right. I have to thank Stuart for uh, seeing that, for doing the clip, and for the individual who did the the voiceover for doing that as well. That was very nice of both of them. Yeah, I love it. I've got to, I've got the call screen up, uh, folks. The number's been playing there for a little while. Four three five two hundred three four seven eight or four three five two hundred fist. So, folks, if you'll call in, uh, we'll be happy to to take those calls. Um, I'm gonna actually move. Let's see here. Yeah, it's been kind of fun to to put all these videos up on YouTube, and and I've been quite surprised. RFM, they're they've gotten you know to a bare minimum, they're getting a hundred views a day, and some of these videos are getting a thousand views a day. It is quite intriguing to kind of see all that take place. But I think we've got a call coming in. Um, call from. So we do have a call coming in. Bill's talking to this yep. person. So Christian is on the air. Christian, you are on Mormonism Live with Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon. Uh, talk to us, my friend. Hey, thanks so much for letting me on, Bill. Uh, second time getting in. Um, just want to say a couple things. The live chat has been the most entertaining, I'll just say, discussion that I've ever seen in one of these uh, uh, podcast sessions. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bill Real, for pointing out my peach sweaty line. Really appreciate it. But the thing that a lot of us really wanted to know uh, that you guys didn't seem to address is, is there any inkling of where Joseph Smith may have come up with the name Riahona 
what it might mean, where that might be from. I mean, he used so many of his names from other physical localities around him. Do we have any evidence where that may have come from? I'll uh, hang up and listen in. Thanks, guys. Perfect. Thank you, my friend. What do you think? Is there? Is, do we have any kind of connection for the word Liahona? Um, it sounds a little Hawaiian. Sounds a little Polynesian. I don't. I don't know anything about like the root of that word or where it might have come from. I'm sure well, apologists would argue that it has a Hebrew uh, ending to it or something. But well, I will tell you that um, uh, I don't know where the word comes from. It appears for the first time in Alma. It does not appear in First Nephi, which many people would think means that it was probably called Liahona on the book of Lehi and written in the 160 pages that subsequently got lost because otherwise, how does Alma know about the name of it hundred years later when it's not in the small plates of Nephi? Mm. So that's one thing that, that that's there. But let me see here. Of course, Hugh Nibley and others like him have tried to uh, break apart Liahona and find an application for it in the old world. It is not really very easy to do so. It doesn't really come out very easily. It certainly doesn't come out as compass, which is what Alma 3738 says. It says Liahona means a compass. So if you could find Liahona meaning a compass in Hebrew, that would be pretty impressive, but it doesn't. So Latter-day Saint scholar Hugh Nibley, which we've all heard of, whom we've all heard of, he provided two additional possibilities for the meaning based on perceived Hebrew roots. He attributed the theory that it refers to a queen bee it's not like a compass, but queen bees, bees always find their way home. So they have this, okay, never mind. Queen bee to a Hebrew university scholar named Shunari and added his own speculation that Liahona might be trans, might be translated to God is the guidance. So I've got a feeling that mm, is probably not really going to be supported by non-Mormon Hebrew scholars. Yeah. Um, apparently another person named John Kirchi. C-U-R-C-I has suggested that the word means the direction of the Lord. So I don't know, but the Lord part would be off the ah ending for Yah or Yahweh. But this is all pretty speculative. And I think what's really clear is that it doesn't mean compass in Hebrew, at least. Yeah. Do you think the the change, well, folks, if you want to call in, by all means, we'd love to take a couple more phone calls. Do you think the change from directors to interpreters was simply to make it more understandable what, what the modern Mormon church, when the change happened, wanted people to take away from the word and didn't want confusion? Or do you think, like, sometimes I think some of this stuff is trying to get something out of the way that might might somehow deter faith. Um, any thoughts there on on that that change? My my first take on it, and it's my only take so far. My first take on it is that they're looking at this word directors, and they've been looking at it for ninety years in the Book of Mormon, and they're going, "What the heck does this mean? Why are they talking about this stone as being a director? That just does not compute, right?" Mm. They hadn't thought about it the way, at least I presented it tonight. That directions appear on the stone, okay, but it doesn't seem to make sense because it's in the context of those verses that are talking about the stone, the ones about the Liahona come later, and there's additional text in between. So it's much later. So I think that that connection between this talking about as directors, the stone and the Liahona is not evident from the text, other than the fact that a plural is used and they're both mentioned in the same chapter and in the same discourse from Alma to his son Helaman. So I think it was just very confusing. I thought, why are they calling this? I mean, first off it's plural, second off they're calling the stone directors, doesn't make any sense. Hey, we know what the seer stone was used for. Yeah. And it, and it should be noted, right? Like if Joseph Smith translate, I'm trying to find the white spot. By the way, I got another one of these cups. Did you? What? I've got another one of these cups. Are you kidding me? Hang on a second. Yeah. I want to see this. Yeah. I got another one of these cups with an image on it. And uh, I don't know what this art is. Maybe one of you guys can point out what this painting is. But the last one was, I think, like treasure diggers. Yeah and or money diggers or something and so this one has got another artistic image on it i don't know what the story is you got one of the last one and i did um but, you got one more than i do but by the way when joseph smith has got his head in the hat i wanted to have kind of a white color but put, putting his head in the hat and he's dictating to oliver cowdery or whoever that this uh that these this leahona would have words appear on it and would guide uh nephi and lehi and their families He's also 
giving credibility to the very act that he's doing, right? Like as he's got his head in a hat and he's dictating the Book of Mormon using a seer stone, which puts words out and he's adding credibility to the very act of what he's doing. And so look, oh, look, guys, look, look, this works just in the same way that my seer stone works. And I, I think when you understand fraudulent behavior, frauds are often making extra efforts to try to add credibility to what they're doing. And, and it does strike me that that's the very thing that's going on in that moment. Yes. And the Book of Mormon is very um, sensitive or it's interactive with the environment of what's going on with Joseph Smith. And right when he's doing all of this, for instance, there, there are so many things that are so interesting. The, the, the direction about the three witnesses of the plates found in the Book of Mormon. So he's receiving this uh, revelation, this translation of the Book of Mormon text, which is telling him what to do and responding to what's going on in his environment. He's got these three witnesses. Okay, they need to see the plates. That's in the Book of Mormon. You got the whole uh, trip with Martin Harris to see Martin, uh, excuse me, Charles Anton in New York with the Anton transcript, right? Well, that gets put into the Book of Mormon. So it's all very, very much, uh, I keep coming, not coming up with a word, but um, it's uh, reactive. It is, um, uh, what do you call it when you're reading something closely? You're reading it. Um, uh, I don't know, scrupulously. I don't know. Yeah, I can't think of it either. But it's responsive. It's responsive to his environment in a very strange way. And in the same way, 2 Nephi 3, all of a sudden he's talking about this prophecy of Joseph of old in Egypt. He's got this prophecy about another guy named Joseph who's going to be a seer. He's going to come down from the same lines. His dad's going to be named Joseph. He's going to be a choice seer among the fruit of your loins. Uh, that whole thing, right? So that's very responsive because it's, it's prophesying of the guy who's actually dictating it with his head in the hat reading it off the seer stone. Yeah. So there's all these things that are going on. And this is another example that you mentioned where it talks in Alma 37 about the seer stone and how it's used in order to translate and bring forth all the wickedness of these people unto light and put it into the record that we have as the Book of Mormon. Whew. Okay. And by the way, uh, Bill's taking another call. Let me put a fine point on that last thing about directors to interpreters in 1920 when the, when the change was made. I think directors was just confusing. The editors did not know what to do with it but they think it's talking about a seer stone. We know a seer stone is not used for directing our way in the wilderness. So interpreters, it was used to interpret. So we'll just change the word directors to interpreters. And that's what they did. And that's what I think may have been behind it. By the way, somebody suggested there might've been a girl several months shy of her 12th birthday who worked in the Smith home in 1829 named Leah Hona. Maybe Leah Hona working in the Smith home as a maid. Maybe that would have caught Joseph Smith's attention. I don't know. Several oh. months shy. Several months shy of her twelfth birthday. Why is that important? Several months shy of her twelfth birthday. I get I the Leah Hona part. I'm just trying to create an underage <laughs> girl working in the Smith home that has a name like Leah Hona. Okay. Now this almost had me going, but I believe that this is a joke. That was a joke. That was okay. me. <laughs> okay. It's not funny. All right. It's a funny joke. It's just I don't want to confuse uh, the the subject with the humor. Yeah, the neighbor girl in New York named Leah Hona. Yes. Joseph was big on big on young girls, if you know what I mean. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so we've got – I will just to make this our last call since we had a long space of time there with no calls. Uh, I believe you said your name is Rob. Is that true? Yeah. Rob, you are on the air with Radio Free Mormon and Bill Real. Uh, take us home, my friend. Hey, thanks, Bill. Thanks, RFM. Great talking with you guys. Uh, first off, I have to apologize. I just – got on your podcast or I'm sorry your YouTube video like uh, five minutes ago so I sorry just kind of the you're a little late to the party my friend oh yeah so but anyway it just kind of happened uh weird um I have just been reading uh Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible and uh it was really interesting this one part as regards uh Joseph's uh, who, not Joseph, I'm sorry, Jacob, who had to work for uh, Leah and Rachel for 14 years. Yeah. And, uh, their father happened to be some guy named Laban, right? Yeah. Well, it kind of turned out that the stories are kind of similar with um, 
you know, Nephi having to go to Laban to get the brass plates and Laban's kind of a greedy fellow and threatens their life and all that stuff. And there's a similar dynamic going with the uh, Laban story in the Bible. And I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, There's a part where Joseph takes his wife and they leave. And Rachel steals something called the teraphim. And uh, I I believe it's in Adam Clark's commentary, roughly around chapters 29, 30, 31. And, well, that this is the first time the teraphim is mentioned. And uh, so he goes through a long explanation of this, and he quotes a number of sources. And, uh, they, you know, they think it might be the household gods. What are, what are these teraphim things? And uh, uh, so Adam Clark is saying, well, there's this Jewish targum that says that actually what happened was Laban had stolen these teraphim and uh, Laban had actually killed a man and he decapitated him. And what they did was they would inscribe these uh, little uh, kind of divine spells on a gold plate and they would put it under the man's head and uh, would receive information from him. You know, so that was one explanation. And then they were talking, well, maybe it might be, a, you know, kind of a divination device there. And mm. uh, he quoted a, you know, some scholar who, would, who said that, well, uh, it might have been an astrolabe, you know, made of burnished brass. And uh, he said the Persians uh, called it an Aster Labha, you know. Ooh. And I know that doesn't, you know, that's yeah. four syllables, you know, the ha, I, I was a Farsi linguist in the army. That just means a plural, so Aster Lab. If only we know? could find that in Adam Clark's just, commentary. But, uh, you know, just very intrigued. Reading through Adam Clark, you know, Genesis, uh, it's pretty easy to see how a creative person could have used some of the wild ass things that Adam Clark had put in his commentary, you know, to uh, make some, you know, probably a book like, I don't know, maybe the Pearl of Great, you know, Book of Abraham, you know, so, you know, there's just so much stuff there. It's amazing. But the only reason I'm telling you or just relaying this is I had just never heard it before. You know, Love it. I, I, you know, but getting in. Uh, by the Appreciate way, RFM, it. I I had gone, moved up to Washington around the same time you did, went to uh, uh, Japan and all that. So we got like a parallel history going there. Of course, you're up there and I'm down here, but uh, I still feel some kind of a connection to you. So Perfect. anyway, God bless both of you guys. You're doing a great work, and I hope I didn't derail this whole No, no, you're good. Thank you, Carl. Appreciate it. Have a great night. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So anything else before we close her out, my friend? No. Now I'm looking, of course, at the Adam Clark Bible commentary and trying to see what it is that he's talking about with the teraphim. Um, I think teraphim has been uh, attempted to be translated, but really nobody knows what it is. They yeah. can't really figure it out. In other words, some people think they might, but there's all this dispute. So there's no clear cut answer. It's a word that's kind of lost in antiquity. There's been about as much success in translating teraphim as there has been in translating Leahona. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, another fine show, my friend. We have unveiled, you've unveiled a, a new thing that I don't think anybody else has picked up on ever. As you point out, if Dan Vogel doesn't know this, if Brian Haglid doesn't know this, then... It's probably unknown, right? And now it's not. Now you've revealed to the world in all of Mormonism a hypothesis for how Joseph Smith came up with what a Liahona would look like, the size of it, how it would operate, how it would, you know, essentially would open, have spindles inside. Um, all of that, I think, is super important to these conversations when apologists take just as much leeway to argue the other side. Uh, we can sure as hell with our big brass balls jump into the conversation and uh, and uh, impose some of this stuff as well. Well, it's been a great night, and I've got to thank once again Stuart Rogers for discovering this and bringing it to my attention. I am just the, um, the instrument for bringing it to the world from Stuart Rogers. I always, always really appreciate it 
when um, I feel like we're able to contribute something substantive to the discussion of Mormon history. I know a lot of times uh, I will pick apart general conference talks. It's a lot of fun. People seem to like it, but really it's not adding something to the discussion in a scholarly fashion. I think tonight's has, and I really think that this element of the hand warmer should be published about, and it should become part of the conversation regarding the Book of Mormon, the translation and Mormon history in a broader sense. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens now that the church knows this. I'm guessing here's what will happen. I think we'd also have to be honest. There may be some of these questions that there is no answer to. Yes. Those, I think, would be the ones we avoid. Yeah.